Well, now I want to start addressing an issue on a topic that uh, I've always found really interesting, but it's been daunting enough, uh, both because of the breadth and amount of information about it, but also the fact that it's more widely understood than all of the other things I've talked about, uh, and that is uh, an analysis on the Roman Empire. Now, this is something that uh, is very difficult because the Roman Empire is such a... a, a iconic and, and long-lasting state and so important uh, to you know the world I, I kind of look at it as the bottleneck in, in, in history all of antiquity you know the the Babylonians the Assyrians the uh, Greeks the Egyptians uh, obviously I'm thinking in you know the Mediterranean basin in Europe and the Western world this obviously would exclude the Mayans or the Indus River or the Chinese or Japanese, but all antiqui antiquity seems to get funneled into the Roman Empire and everything after the Roman Empire stems from it, it seems like. This is probably not technically accurate, but uh, it's largely true. And it's a really interesting topic and one can analyze the Roman Empire from an Austro-Libertarian perspective in so many ways, and I think I will make subsequent uh, videos about this, probably not all of them right away, because I need to do a lot more reading before I can. Uh, but uh, there's that. There's also, as an American, as a Libertarian, there's a lot of interesting parallels, uh, mostly because the Founding Fathers, who... Uh, had a lot in common, I think, actually, with the patricians of ancient Rome. Uh, deliberately emulated uh, the Roman Empire, or at least the Roman Republic. Excuse me, not the Roman Empire. The Roman Republic, in their uh, drafting of the Constitution and their conception of of government, and we can see this today in uh, government architecture, which is essentially Romanesque. Uh, there are Greek elements, but Roman society is a Hellenized society, so that's hardly surprising. Uh, it's in the nomenclature. If you ever watch C-SPAN, I remember when I realized this, it was somewhat of an epiphany. Watch C-SPAN when they speak in Congress. You see, you know, go, go watch a Rand Paul speech, you know, because he usually has good ones. If you look on the wall behind him, there are these symbols, and it's a... It's a a roll of, of sticks with an axe head with a wreath wrapped around it. What is that? Well, that's a fasces. It's the symbol of Roman authority. And uh, it's also the derivative uh, of the word fascist, <laughs> ironically enough. Of course, the ones in, in the halls of Congress were put there before the parties in Europe existed. Uh, but the dome, the columns, they're, I mean, they're Greek columns, but the, the stand, the the orientation on the buildings is much is modeled after a Roman temple, uh, and then you can look even as a libertarian who hasn't heard of the Cato Institute. Obviously, uh, the Cato Institute is named after uh, I think a Cato the Younger. There are several Catos, but the the famous one who committed suicide rather than um, yield to the dictatorship of Julius Caesar. Uh, by committing suicide. There's just many, many, many uh, different uh, explicit parallels. The, the Founding Fathers really took Rome as a model. There's Now it's kind of more uh, politically correct to emphasize the Greeks because the Greeks invented democracy, um, although that's probably an overstatement uh, since the idea of having some kind of elections at some level goes back before Greeks, the Mesopotamians certainly were doing it. I wouldn't be surprised if they were doing it a long time ago, although not necessarily on that much of a scale. Um, but the Founding Fathers rather thought ill of Greece, uh, especially of Athens, because it was an empire. Of course, Rome became an empire too, and that's of course what's so interesting. There are many parallels uh, with the United States and Rome, and I would like to uh, look at some of them. I'm not going to do it in this video per se, the one I do want to look at is, uh, in, in a lot of my videos, I've talked about the libertarian spark in American society. And given 
if you look at Cato and you look at the, the writings in the late Republic um, among the optimists, the uh, very conservative senators who opposed um, you know, the triumvirates or the dictatorships, the people like Caesar or Pompey or Crassus or Sulla earlier, uh, there's a lot of talk of the evils of tyranny. And the American government is largely also based on an abhorrence to tyranny. The whole uh, construction of the Constitution is uh, intended to prevent, or at least apparently prevented, uh, intended to prevent the arising of a tyranny as a weak executive with a, a separation of powers. And the Roman Republic is also seen to be this way. But I think there's a big difference uh, between the two. The number one difference is that the American government was conceived and debated and created, you know, over the course of a couple months, basically. Uh, there were traditions and uh, precedents going back much further indeed to Rome, but it's certainly uh, more directly to English common law, English history. Uh, but, you know, the whole idea of having, you know, let's have a bicameral Congress, let's have a weak executive, let's have a judiciary that's independent and, you know, uh, independent states. Of course, there's a whole debate. Really, if you, if you look, I think there's a good argument to be made, and I would refer people to the book, The Sovereign States, which is not a libertarian book at all, that really there isn't really a nation state in the United States. There are individual states that are confederated, you know, in a central government. But... Uh, this is fundamentally different than what happened in Rome because in Rome there was never a point where they all got together and said let's make a tyranny resistant government it was a system that evolved over centuries now the the information on this is not well known um, there were a number of Roman historians uh, earlier in their history the first one we know about is a guy named Pictor now who was alive and wrote in the 200s BC we only know that he exists we don't have any of his writings and so the only things we can really read about the early history of Rome were by Livy and Polybius those are the Polybius was a Greek uh, Livy was a Roman and I think Polybius was writing in the in the mid second century BC the 150s and Livy was in the first century you know the the 50s or thereabouts could get that wrong. Uh, they are the closest writers and they write about uh, the early history of Rome. Now the one thing that's clear is that uh, originally Rome was not a republic at all. It had kings, so-called the regal period, uh, allegedly founded by Romulus in I think 709 BC. Again, there's some dispute about that. Archaeology says it probably was founded a little bit later, although I always think that it's a little conceited for archaeologists to think that they found the earliest hut or whatever. Uh, but there is this regal period, and we kn we're fairly certain that uh, the written sources uh, are apocryphal or mythical or legendary because they only list there being seven kings over a roughly 245-250 year period. And there's literally no other interval in history where there's that few kings over such a long time. I think their average reign would have to be 35 years. Uh, and it's rare to have even one king to have a 35-year reign, let alone seven in a row. Also, their names are kind of funny. Uh, they suggest that they might be apocryphal, uh, not least of which Romulus, I mean, who supposedly the son of Mars, obviously that's likely not true, <laughs> uh, literally anyway. Uh, but what's clear though is when the Repu when the, the last king leaves, is driven out of the city, uh, they don't get together and create a republic. The institutions uh, that formed the republic already existed and they had developed over time. This is the Senate, which I was surprised to learn recently, uh, was not actually a legislative body, it was more of an advisory council of the wealthiest people in, in the society. Um, and then you have the various uh, plebeian orders, the tribunes, and it looks like most of these uh, 
about the councilship. The, the, these institutions really developed over time, or at least this is the most common view now. And it wasn't like the United States Constitution, an instance where people got together and uh, said, what can we do to prevent tyranny? And they came up with a system. What it would most likely be the case is that you had a monarch, a series of monarchs, and uh, a power-sharing arrangement arose between them and their subjects, uh, specifically with their more powerful subjects. Uh, this strikes me as a kind of Hellenization. There was a lot of Hellenization in Italy uh, around this time. Uh, and obviously in southern Italy, there were actually direct Greek colonies established in Tarentum and a number of other cities, of course in Sicily as well, especially at Syracuse. Uh, but the Etruscans, the northern neighbors of the Romans, who the Romans themselves cited as kind of being their forebears in a lot of ways, were, you know, an Iron Age people that Hellenized. And one of the things with Hellenization is a, a movement away from kingship. Uh, and the the development of these well let me, let me go back the American Constitution and the American government at least explicitly and and we know in the minds of many of the founders was intended to provide liberty and the purpose of the state was to provide liberty and protect liberty life liberty and pursuit of happiness that was the purpose of the state and for that to occur, a system of checks and balances was envisioned. You know, it was envisioned a whole view on minarchism, and you need to have uh, you need to have a government to you know protect your liberty. Now, this is not true, but uh, it was it was a belief. But I don't see this as the genesis of the Roman system at all, uh, because even in the Republic, there's a clear notion that the purpose of the state is not to protect the citizens or the citizenry or to protect their liberty. The purpose of the state is to aggrandize itself and the citizens are uh, there to serve the state for its greater and there's uh, there's actually tracks where uh, people will be debating the, the, the plebs, the lower class people who are not slaves but who are less than the patricians would sometimes have uh, there'd be social uh, unrest between them and the patricians, and they'd have debates. And there's whether they're true or not. The uh, the notion, the the stories relate of people saying, "Well, I'm a I'm a plebeian. I'm a poor person, and uh, every year for 20 years I had to leave and fight in the army. Uh, and uh, you know, I live in the same house I was born in, but I'm still going to do whatever the uh, Whatever the government tells me to do, whatever the councils and the Senate say I need to do, I will do. And I think uh, if you look at it, uh, I think that the development of the Senate and these other councils uh, is less to do with providing liberty and more to do with protecting the interests of an aristocracy. Um, the idea of having a monarch is pretty common in early states. But the problem with a monarch, especially an absolute one, is that uh, the only one who has any real security is the monarch. Uh, other influential, wealthy people are always at risk of being despoiled by the monarch. And so it is within their interest to do something to curtail the power of the monarch. Not because they care about the liberty of everybody, not because there's any kind of idea that government should be minimal or not control the destinies of everyone, but just a a very self-interested view that they don't they they want the state to not be able to despoil them so easily, and I think this is at the root of the rising up of uh, legislative and elective bodies like republics and democrat uh, democracies in Greece and later in Rome. And I mean that's the system that you see. You see the the the, uh, the patricians, the senatorial class, the equestrians, the really rich people. Uh, they're the ones who are forming the legislative bodies. They're the ones who are running the legislative bodies. If you look at how the voting was set up in Rome, uh, 
the lower classes votes even though they were the most people didn't count for anything so the point wasn't to protect their liberty the point was to protect the wealth of the aristocracy from uh, a monarch and the idea of protecting liberty is really not present uh, and if you look at you know the people that are lionized like Cato or Cicero uh, these guys are absolute aristocrats uh, they think that they are above uh, lesser people in a very uh, you know egotistical way and their musings about liberty or whatever are, are pretty hollow by American standards at least I would say so um, so the the Roman state didn't exist uh, that, well the other thing is from the, from the point of view of the Roman state the people of Rome exist to aggrandize the Roman state. The point of the Roman state was to go and to conquer and to win glory for itself, not for its people. And this is, I think, different from the foundation of the American state. There is no, nothing rhetorically in the Constitution that suggests that we're all just here so that Uncle Sam can have a powerful army. Now, that is how it is now, but that's not what's in the Constitution, and it's not what's in the writings of most of the founding fathers even people like Hamilton you get the sense that they just think a big government imperial system would be good for everybody now that's wrong and that's evil uh, but there's not a sense that the reason we need to have a government is to aggrandize the state and the, for the glory of the state and people exist for the service of the state but you do get that sense when you look at Rome and basically all societies in, in antiquity uh, they there's a real strong belief in Leviathan and the checks and balances where they existed was more to prevent to protect part of Leviathan it would be like oh I don't know the military forming a a a a body in the United States government that would say well we're going to object if the president does something that hurts our interests uh, that wouldn't mean that the U.S. government was now very libertarian or cared about tyranny. It would just mean that people in the military were concerned that they might their their access to the public trough might be curtailed, and so uh, you know they want to have some say over a a plenary imperial presidency. So these these early states. Uh, with kings, with monarchs, uh, the other elites in society had an interest in curtailing their power. There's also another interesting thing here. I don't know if this, you could prove this, but I've heard it said Europe is one of the most uh, segmented regions in the world. If you look at it on a map, you know, the Africa, Asia are these very large land masses that are pretty contiguous. If you look at Europe, basically the whole thing is peninsula, peninsula, island, island. Uh, mountains running everywhere in different directions with rivers going out radi radially like from the Alps you have the Rhine but then you have the Po and the Danube and the Rhone and then you have different you have mountains in the Balkans down the spine of Italy across the Pyrenees then you have all these islands like Ireland and Great Britain you know peninsulas like Jutland, Iberia, Scandinavia, Italy, the, uh, the Peloponnese You've got the Black Sea, the Adriatic Sea, the Aegean Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Tethys Sea, the Bay of Biscay. It's a very, very segmented geographically, which means that it's actually very difficult to govern by one state. This is as opposed. This is distinct from, say, Egypt, where everybody lives in one valley, and you go twenty miles either side, and there's nothing. And so states have been very it's been very easy for states to regulate uh, and rule over the Nile River Valley. And it's relatively easy for people to do this in the Euphrates and the Tigris River Valley. And the emperors in China have not had a big problem ruling over the eastern area of China. But in Europe, if the people on, say, I don't know, 
if the people on Sicily say they don't like the Greeks, then they're on, a, they're on an island and they can defend themselves. Uh, or if you look at, say, a, a later but famous example, Byzantium, Byzantium is perfectly situated to defend itself. And even when it had the most inept government imaginable, uh, the natural strength of its position made it almost impregnable to those who tried to overthrow it. And there's just thousands of places like that in Europe. And so monarchs were not, I think they had, they had physical limits to their potential power that were not present other, in other places. And so in Egypt, it would be hard to imagine uh, a class of aristocrats challenging the pharaoh. Uh, because where are they going to run and hide if, if the pharaoh doesn't like what they're going to do? You know, in Athens, they could run and hide in the Acropolis or in the hills or any number of other mountains or hop on a boat and go to some little island. And so there's more diffusion of power and it's easier to establish these counter monarchical institutions. And uh, obviously, Italy is a peninsula with a peninsula with a peninsula. I mean, you've got the boot and the heel, the mountains running down the middle, the Apennines, which of course have rivers running out to the sea, like the Tiber, but you know, the Rapido, and so on and so forth, the Po. Of course, that more comes from the, the, uh, the Alps than the Apennines, but uh, it's a very segmented area, and so uh, it's, it's difficult to rule. And also, it's not quite as fertile, so you don't have the huge surpluses. It's more seasonal. That's, that's a whole other video, but I think all I'm saying in this one I'm going to talk about some other topics in, in, in subsequent videos, but uh, the, the Roman state is a state for a state's sake, not a state for any kind of libertarian ideology state. There's no uh, pretension of doing this for the well-being of the people. Uh, all the talk about tyranny is more they don't want a king because they're afraid of what they'll do to the aristocracy. And as we see, with the fall of the Republic, uh, no one worries about tyranny once the emperor is in charge. Uh, at that point, Rome was very, very wealthy and was able to despoil the wealth and tax the wealth of the entire Mediterranean basin. And so the aristocracy could be well pleased to be wealthy, uh, even without uh, pretending to care about tyranny and uh, just revel in the glories of the state, which they basically did for a couple hundred years. So I'll make a couple other ones. I want to do a lot more reading. There's some other primary sources I have to look at and some uh, other surveys of Roman history. I would recommend though, if you go on the YouTube channel of Magister Jacobs, he has a 24 hour lecture series. It was made in the nineties by a company that would make long lecture series is about uh, various historical topics. Uh, if you look it up, it's called, well, if anyone wants to see it, let me know and I'll, I'll send you a link. Uh, it's stuff I had, I had mostly read about it, but it was really good to, to put it all in context and, and, and in order. Uh, but I definitely recommend that for anyone who uh, doesn't want to read uh, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire or Tacitus or anything like that. I'd recommend that as well. So, all right, that's it.